Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, competency in the organisation. Um, I'm a big uh, fan of software and uh, innovation, but my day job as a, as a consultant with um, a company called NDB, and I've been doing that for the last, uh, well, since 2003, it, it's all about uh, delivering value to my clients. My clients are oil and gas companies around the world. And um, in order to deliver value, uh, you have to really focus on the implementation. So the, uh, the talk is really about the, um, the competency we need uh, in an organization to be able to face the, the challenges and opportunities that come from big data. Let's see if I get the buttons right. So um, simple agenda, uh, based upon um, in the last two years, we've been doing a lot of uh, work with different clients on, on what might be called <coughs> data analytics. Um, or uh, uh, looking at cloud services into oil and gas companies. Everybody's really waiting for when the technical applications that we all know and love uh, to do our geoscience are going to be all available within the cloud so that we can reduce our uh, technology footprint in, in the office and, and, and make some benefits there. Are those things ready just yet? Well, the, the, um, the situation is evolving very quickly. So, uh, but... In the last couple of years, we've been looking at big data, we've been looking at um, uh, analytics, and, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of these topics in relation to uh, some of the examples that we've been working on uh, in the last couple of years. Nice little picture there of, um, uh, from, BBC, from the BBC from quite a few years ago. Uh, I don't know if you recognize that, but there's a, a sketch in the 1960s that's quite famous. Um, the way I look at it is that whenever I'm talking about an oil company or any kind of organization, I always think about it in terms of three levels of, of people. The, the guy with the bowler hat is the one who's concerned about the money. He's concerned about the uh, investment and the return on investment. And the technology is there, yeah, that's great, but what's it going to cost and when's it going to show some benefit to me? The guy in the middle, Ronnie Barker, as we might recognize him, uh, he represents, in my mind, the, uh, the operations manager, the guy who uh, is the asset manager, who's focused on the operation. Let's keep that pump pumping. Let's keep the, our uh, production profile up there. Uh, let's, let's uh, you know, if something's going to work, well, that's okay, but let's get it in and let's get it moving. Whereas, whereas the, uh, the geoscientist here, or the technologist, um, maybe has a, 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 a different view on this, uh, because they're actually quite interested in the science for science's sake. They're interested in technology for technology's sake. And um, what, uh, what's important for, for any organization uh, looking at big data is that the, whatever the uh, competency is, it has to exist at all these three different levels. Uh, and, and, and some examples of that for, um, in, in, in recent uh, um, assignments that, that my company's been doing, we, we, we quite often follow on from when uh, the guy with the bowler hat who's been reading The Economist or, or sitting in uh, the lounge at Heathrow um, is talking to somebody from uh, uh, one of the big six consultancy companies or big four consultancy companies, whatever they are now. Oh, yeah, you need a, you need a data management strategy. Um, you know, this is impacting everybody. So, of course, he wants to take some action uh, and, and get things moving there. But... What happens? What happens? It, what happened in this particular case is that the management consulting team could could very easily talk about the uh, issue with uh, uh, mass technology, as we call it, or generic technology, as I call it. You know, what are we going to do with SAP? What are we going to do with uh, uh, Oracle database? What are we going to do with uh, uh, Microsoft products? But when it comes to the technology side and the, and the the thing that makes an oil and gas company different from any other company in the world. Uh, they, they hit a bit of a barrier there. So you've got to, be, you've got to be conscious of the fact that what some person can do or what some organization can do for you. <coughs> another, another company that we, we work with um, had some technologists, um, IT folks, let's call them what, what they are, uh, IT folks, and I've worked in IT in the past in, in, uh, in, in what we might call generic IT. People, these are smart people. Uh, they, they get busy and they get interested and they start experimenting with technology. And the key, but the key thing is to make sure that experimentation is aligned with what is useful for the organization. Uh, you know, these, these guys were implementing Hadoop, which is a, 
uh, a multi-platform um, potential data store for as much data as you, as you like uh, with, with, a, with a different kind of way of accessing the data that goes across all the platforms. Fascinating stuff. But really, in, in the oil and gas world, especially in the, um, in the upfront side, we don't generate that many types of transactions. We're not generating that kind of range of data that's going to be of use, for, use in all that. Uh, maybe in, in real-time data, that's, that's where, it, where it could be different. But the key thing is to, uh, to have that competency at all levels and to make sure that your geoscientists and engineers are engaged. So there's no doubt about it that, that I've been in, in, in data management, let's say, for more than 20 years. I'm not sure what you're supposed to do when you've been more than 20 years doing things. It seems a bit odd to say, you know, 32 and a half or 28, because nobody really cares. But 20 years, <coughs> 20 years is a long time to be involved in data management. And so uh, my, my take on it is, well, big data, it's, it's an evolution of data management, perhaps. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about the difference between big data and data management. But there's some fantastic opportunities here from the new tools that are being developed. Uh, you know, we talked about AI and uh, machine learning tools. Uh, we, we're able to compare and contrast a wider range of things. We use, use more uh, processing power uh, that's available to just do more things and, and get, more, uh, get more results and, and for the human in the end to look at well, what, it, what is making a difference here. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, new data types and of course everything's got chips on it um, you know, so that we, can, we know where everything is. Here's, a, here's a, a bike, this is the new bike scheme in my local area. So uh, what I like about this is it really shows what happens when you uh, bring, it's like a confluence of all the different technologies that are available. So whoever developed this bike, and it's a company in China, the biggest bike sharing scheme in the world, they haven't invented all this stuff themselves. But what they've been able to do is bring all those components together into something that, in this case, um, as a user, I don't need to go to a particular place to find a bike. I can look on my mobile phone and find out where those bikes are. And when I get home, I can just leave it outside the house. I don't need to go and park it somewhere and then walk another 200 yards. I mean, it might not be there the next morning, um, but that's, that's one of the challenges. But it's a confluence of a, a number of different things. So, you know, you couldn't invent that if everybody didn't have a mobile phone on them, if, if every mobile phone didn't have Bluetooth. Because I, I, did, I did find out that I, I wondered whether these things were actually connected back to uh, the, uh, the kind of hub or whether they... But no, you have a little Bluetooth connection and you actually talk directly to the... Uh, to the bike itself, and then the bike unlocks and lets you get on with it. So, um, but the, the opportunities here through all these things, going back to the value to the organization, is about reducing costs. Fewer people are having the experts, and I think this is something in oil and gas we've been looking for for a long time, having the experts, the fewer experts that we have, able to do more things or make more judgments about more things from the safety of wherever they are, as opposed to being in the field. Um, Prediction and planning is something that I've been working on quite a lot with uh, some of the old companies in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, tracking assets, quicker, more robust decisions. So there are the opportunities from big data. Uh, this is a, a slide that was produced by McKinsey, well-known and respected uh, um, consultancy company. Um, I only put this on there because, uh, as you can see, there's a bias in their mind or in the minds of the people that they interviewed to produce this graph um, to, to look more along the lines of uh, towards production, the production side of things as, as big data making an impact. This was in 2015. Um, and, and it's probably true that where we're, we're more mechanical, where we're more engineering focused, uh, we have those uh, more opportunities. So it's fascinating to see in this conference how we might take that back and hear about some of the uh, exploration uh, technologies that are, uh, are being developed. Well, when you say data, People see data as being a completely different things. And this relates back to those, those three strange people, in, the, in two of them in hats, I think, or three of them in hats. When I talk about data, what I've got here, I've got two examples, really. I've got the example of uh, a download from the PPDM uh, data model. This has been developed over probably more than 20 years, or it could be 28, it could be 32 and a half, I don't know. But... Um, it's, it's a fascinating uh, description of every aspect of the oil and gas process in a strict data modeling. So when you do strict data modeling, entity relationship diagram, you really can only have two different levels. You have a, a, an entity and an attribute. And, and then you, you have to create the model behind all that in order to get the systems to work effectively 
uh, and not duplicate your data, although sometimes you do that for, for different purposes. But I'm not going to go into that right now. But when I'm doing some work with, with a client, uh, and here's, here we did some work for um, a client in Norway where we're looking at data from well reports. And I want to be able to communicate to a geoscientist or an engineer uh, something about the data that they would like to see in order to make some judgments about the, the physical world. I'm not, going to I'm not going to show them this data model because uh, they're not interested. Well, I, I'm vaguely interested in it, but, but, but so, so what, I, what I'm able to do is produce a, a sort of conceptual model that uses terms and, and phrases that um, they're, they're more interested in. And then what I can do as a, as a, as a technic, technical guy, I can then trace back from whatever we describe as being the things they're interested in to the sources of that data. And the, some of the sources may be reports, some of the sources may be um, relational databases, or some of the sources may be things that we're not even managing right now within IM or data management or within the old company. Um, you know, where do they get the, the exchange rate that gets used to um, uh, look at a reservoir model and do the economics of it? Well, that's coming off somebody's spreadsheet on the laptop. Well, when did they last change that? I have no idea uncontrolled, but people are making decisions on those things. But the key thing here is that people see da data differently. Now, having, what we did was uh, we, we developed a methodology around, around building these pictures of the data, if you like. And then what, we, what I found was when, when I looked at uh, some of the work that was going on in Norway in Project Optique, if anybody's familiar with Optique, they have a very similar uh, approach, but of course they call that an ontology. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, and it's much more rigorous than what I'm doing. But what I, my, my approach is really about, you know, I've got to hit the ground running. I've got to be able to talk to people within a short space of time. What about the technology plays in big data? So this is a fantastic map produced by uh, Matt Turk and Jim Howe. Uh, again, a couple of years old. There's an awful lot of technology out there. Awful lot of technology. And my take on all this is, well, the technology shouldn't come first. The technology should come after we know something about what we need to do. Um, what's really useful, of course, is that uh, this big data landscape uh, is developed really for, for the, the, the digital natives, the, the Amazons and the Googles of this world who don't have the legacy systems we have, uh, who may be more interested in speech recognition or maybe more interested in security than, than our, our technology uh, is. But... Um, Nevertheless, pretty useful to be able to see um, the different ways in which the, uh, the, data, the, the different technologies are characterized. And, and, and we, we might take some of that and we might uh, sort of characterize our own workflow. So this is a workflow um, built for a decision-making process, with a, with a, uh, which is our kind of standard approach to all this. Um, so on the, on, the, on, the, on the side over there, we've got the business decision, and then we model the business decision. And the what I tried to do for, for this uh, model was to separate out the different areas of technology. So if we are going to start looking at what software we should use, we kind of know how it's going to get applied, and we know wh what it's going to get used for. And we're not going to confuse the, uh, the, the guys researching into Hadoop. Well, actually, it's of no real relevance or value here. Maybe down the line at somewhere else. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an area of data organization and, and, and data gathering that needs to happen a coalition, coalition of the, the different views of the different databases involved, or, or even some of the data that's not in a database. There's a, there's a visualization and reporting element, and, and what you find is that the visualization uh, side of things is really, really important for communication. And there's some fanta fantastic visuals that, uh, that are being uh, generated. But then the, the analytics and machine learning, in this particular case, uh, this may be the starting point for some uh, uh, business cases, but in this particular case, what we were doing was we were using uh, the analytics and machine learning to go back and clean the data set where we found that data uh, was being used in a, in a decision that was suspect or, or could have been improved. So we're using the machine learning and the, uh, 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 and the analytics to actually go back and clean the data set. Data science, data management. So. Data science uh, is best run by the people in the business who understand what the business is meant to be doing, the, the subject matter experts. But data management, uh, which is the kind of curation and the, and the delivery of data in, a, in, a normal, in, a, in a, uh, an accepted state, and the storage and the, and the reference to that data for the uh, business is best done by the data managers. 
And I was asked the question, uh, well, is, data, is, is all this de analytics, is it going to um, obviate the need for a data management? And uh, it may do in years to come, but at the moment, my experience is that you can't really do data analytics unless you've organized the data in the first place. If you've got a whole bunch of well data that's all clean and nice and ready to go, and you've got a bunch of seismic data that's in a lovely database, then you're in, a, you're in good shape. You've got, you've got reference data that you can really use and you can do some analytics on that. Because the first thing you have to do when you've got unstructured data is put it in some kind of structure, which is the role of your uh, data management people. The, the painting, just for distraction really, uh, uh, Peter Bruegel, the elder, I think, uh, but it's, it's the death of Icarus. And if you can see here, uh, Icarus has just fallen in the water. And, um, and I suppose that the painting was all about hubris, about flying too close to the sun and uh, uh, your wings are melting. But really what I like about it is that the, is that the farmers, uh, the guy using the plow, which is the technology of the day, and the guy with his uh, crook and his dog tending the sheep, they're completely oblivious to what's going on, right? So here's this famous historical moment and they're looking the other way. And, uh, and I just use the analogy of, of, uh, of some of our oil companies where you've got people in technology doing one thing and people in the business doing another thing. Well, let's get them working together. Strategy, penultimate slide. So uh, the, uh, what's important is to have a plan in all this, uh, to put some context around it. So uh, the plan here is, uh, you probably can't read it, but it's 433 versus uh, 442. Um, I, don't know if we've got any, I don't know if we've got any Arsenal fans in the audience. I um, probably don't want to talk about football right now. But the, the idea is that uh, even the most basic formation tells the player where they should be and what they should do. And, and if things go wrong, you can, at half time, you can have a, a word and say, well, by the way, uh, keep an eye on that guy because uh, uh, you're not really standing where you should be. But, it, uh, but a plan, uh, a value of a data strategy, strategy and, and I, I, you know, it's amazing the number of oil companies I go into and, and data isn't such a thing that they've been that interested in in the past. The idea of a data strategy doesn't really uh, fill anybody with any interest, but it's just putting the basics down on a bit of paper to say this is how we're going to approach a subject. In fact, today you have to have somebody in an organisation who's responsible for data because of the new data regulations coming out from the European uh, Union, which we're still part of. Um, the, uh, the Oil and Gas Authority has a, a requirement for uh, a nominated data, data, data person as well, somebody responsible for the data. So it sets the priorities, we're able to monitor progress, and uh, hopefully uh, prevents too much uh, poor investment or wasted effort. So my last slide really is, um, it's, it's important to have data competency at all levels, and it's essential these days in, in, a, in an oil and gas organization. And I presume, in, a, presume in, in some of the research uh, organizations we've been hearing about here today as well. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Big data is not really a technology problem. There's a lot of technology out there, but let's do some basics first. Let's find out what we want before we start testing and looking at that. Data science does need data management at the moment. And uh, I'd like to think that uh, a data strategy is an essential guide for the organization. So hopefully that was uh, helpful. That I'm finished then. Thank you very much.